a beautiful example of Saladon, Chinese, beautiful Chinese moss green ceramic. And he stood it alongside of some of the elaborate productions of the European uh, porcelain manufacturers and even some of the great historical pieces of early European ceramics. And he said that he discovered in the Chinese pieces something that was lacking in the European art. And this thing that was lacking was this wonderful rightness of things. He suddenly realized that these Chinese masters of art had been moving from a canon of art that was much more rich than that of most of the European masters. He learned, for example, that this great ivory work, this great jade, these marvelous pieces of crystal, these ancient excavated bronzes, came from people who had a great sense of life value. They came from people who worked tremendously from a religious inspiration, and yet their religion was not forever obvious. He looked in the great galleries of Europe and he found that most of the masters from Botticelli down to Velasquez had painted principally Madonnas or crucifixions. He found the Chinese equally religious, but they did not move into this obvious area of religion. He found in them this marvelous worship of the fitness of things. He found in them a spirituality that expressed itself through an absolute inner certainty of creation of beauty. He knew that these artists must have been great human beings. They had to be. They may have been on school, they may have been on letters, they may have come from a country in political turmoil, they may have been enslaved, but they were still great. They were great because they had the tremendous power to put the thing in the right place. They had the marvelous sense of utter simplicity, which was in violent contrast to the elaborate productions of the Dresden Kilns or the Royal Worcester of England. These things were simply too much. But here, in a simple bowl of magnificent design, the mathematics, the geometry, the tremendous structure, the skeletal part of art, was there, uh, not adorned, and most adorned by its own simplicity. So he knew that he had something good. He knew that the world would sometime find that it was good. And they did. The world came to know the importance of this type of thing. Another collector who had a great reputation was very peculiar in his own taste. It is said of him that he never would buy a piece of art that had been excavated from the ground. Now, why he had this peculiar viewpoint, we do not know. It was his taste. It was his sense of value. He also collected Chinese art, but he only collected more recent things. He collected them only because the, that they still had about them the complete meaning which the artist himself had intended. It is the curse of the antique, to this man at least, that it must fade. Most people today would not recognize the Mona Lisa if they saw it as it was originally painted. It has been overpainted and varnished and restored and repaired. Uh, what we call the mellow color of the old masters is nothing but the gradual changing of the varnish tones from age, in which we see the picture now as we term it marvelously mellow, but as, in terms of the original, simply half faded out. This man wanted only that which was in the same condition as was envisioned by the original artist. And in ceramics he was able to advance this. He was able to secure magnificent examples that appeared as though they were made yesterday, 
and broke all the laws that they should be old in order to be good. Yet many of them were old, but they were perfection in themselves. Because this man wanted the art only in the color, in the form, in the condition in which the artist created it. Now this is a highly technical, highly critical point, but it is still part of the point of value. Another person likes to collect pressed autumn leaves between the pages of a book. The wonderful color of the dried leaf has a fascination of its own, but it can never be actually regarded as the same as the living leaf. Some want the living leaf, some like the pressed leaf between the pages of a book. So there are these different ways in which we approach value. And this value sense certainly does arise from our own psychic integration. It rises from certain polarizations of consciousness uh, which symbolize or set forth our own instincts or the, the peculiar formula of our own individuality. So in our search for what constitutes value, the ageless quest for value, we have to finally go into ourselves and study there, if we can, uh, the laws of this universal mystery. Because it is present in all things. Primitive man sought value just as modern man does. And primitive man, even when he was struggling for survival, produced a great deal of non-surviving factors because he wanted them to be beautiful. He made a spoon in order to dip his soup. A plain, simple, crude spoon would have served his purpose, but he couldn't resist the instinct to decorate it. Not because it increased its usefulness, but because in some way it became more pleasing to himself. And this pleasing something that is non-utilitarian, this overtone, in which satisfaction rises above usefulness, has something to do with the rise and origin of the consciousness of value. Now, in man himself, we have a being with a certain subconscious maturity. I think it is necessary always to agree with the basic premise of Socrates, namely that there is something inside of man, something at the source of himself, which is better than his common knowledge of himself. Better than the person he knows is the person in himself whom he does not know. If, therefore, we search deeply enough into man, we will find as we go deeper, more and not less, that man moves from a rich core existence into a diluted circumference existence. That in man there is something that is richer in the knowledge of value than his normal, average, everyday conscious experience. This other thing which is richer is the thing which value must ultimately cater to, or which must help man to reveal value. So we can, uh, we can apply this in a way to the contemplation of art. Most great art lovers, especially lovers of Asiatic or ancient arts, uh, choose their art in a very simple way. They simply sit down and let the art move them. They become quiet to the art. They, in some mysterious way, relax the artificial criteria of the conscious mind and seek for the subconscious experience of value. If the person ceases to use his mind, ceases to use his emotion, ceases to make use of formulas, gets his eye away entirely from the price tag and simply relaxes, he really believes and usually can prove that he has a taste inside of himself that is a surer guide to value than any rationalization which he can apply. Consequently, the very process of art knowing is a meditational process. 
And the entire experience of value is a meditational process. The person cannot depend upon others, cannot depend upon his own experience, and does not dare to depend upon exterior symbols which are deceptive. He can only come to the final conclusion from his own subconscious. And when his subconscious nature, looking at this object or this thing which he is considering, very quietly says to the conscious personality, this I like, the chances are that value has been found. The internal part of man, according to Plato, and he derived it, of course, from Pythagoras, was, as a Greek theory, a kind of living psychic geometrizer. In other words, this internal part of man was an harmonic formula. It was a composition itself, as natural, as perfect, and as inevitable as the balanced pattern of a snowflake. Not only is it true that God geometrizes, but it is true that the human soul is a pattern of absolute order. Therefore, this is a pattern of absolute fitness. And the only part of man best capable of judging value is that part of man which is itself the most valuable. And the soul is by many degrees more valuable than the body. And it is more important to achieve the contentment of the soul than it is to achieve the comfort of the body. And nearly all creative persons or real idealists or constructive individuals have been willing to sacrifice the body for the soul because they have recognized where the true value in living actually exists. So Socrates would more or less take the ground that what we would call acceptance or to like a thing greatly, even perhaps to venerate it, arises from the fact that it satisfies the harmonic structure of our own subconscious. That this harmonic structure is the compendium or the sum of our own psychic growth cannot be doubted. But whereas our psychic growth upon the surface is a series of fragments, in this inner part, this growth has been assimilated into a formula or into an orderly design. And it is from this total formula that the subconscious values or estimates things, whereas man estimates only from the superficial appearances and surfaces of things. Well, the Greeks tell, took the attitude that the only way that we can really intuit value is to become so quiet that we can experience the psychic movement in ourselves. We can sense our own psychic nature either rejoicing or being offended. And finally, if the inner life of the person is offended, he will never be satisfied with the objects. Satisfaction must mean compatibility and value must always be compatible. If we go outside of the problem of arts and matters of that nature in our search of life values, we must then seek again for this compatibility. And I think in this we have another interesting phase of philosophy that touches once more into our Zen department where some of our primary interest is in connection with this quest for value. In the, in the Zen thinking about things, value uh, takes on the coloring of a Buddhistic kind of experience. And in Buddhism,